What's up, world? I'm Matt Newberg from Hungary, and this is The Feed. Each episode, we'll dive into conversations with the industry insiders who are leveraging technology to shape the way we eat. On today's episode of The Feed, I sat down with Zach Abbott, founder and CEO of ZBiotics, a manufacturer of the world's first genetically engineered probiotics. In this episode, we'll chat about how ZBiotics started with a product that aims to reduce the negative effects of hangovers, the current state of the sober curious movement, and the implications of GMO labeling. Well, I'm very excited to have you on today, Zach. Um, I've been personally a, a fan of ZBiotics um, when I do choose to drink, and I do drink from time to time. I think any any uh, human that is social uh, finds themselves inevitably in a situation where they, um, you know, it's it's a temptation. But sometimes you you got to do it, and and you want to do it, and uh, this ha- has helped me really be responsible. But we'll get into all that. But I'd love for you to just Talk about your background um, and, you know, some of the research you've done at University of Michigan and then kind of how you formed this company, ZBiotics. Yeah, absolutely. Like, so, yeah, exactly. I did my PhD uh, in microbiology at the University of Michigan. Um, There I was not working on research that would become ZBiotics specifically, but um, I was studying how uh, bacteria sort of regulate their genomes um, and um, became sort of an expert at that and uh, I did leverage that expertise uh, when I started Zbiotics, but the idea on Zbiotics actually came from um, the observation that we essentially like that that there are these this really powerful class of um, bioactive compounds in, in in the form of uh, enzymes, um, which are you know basically proteins that do some sort of function biochemically, and and um, you know the drug industry was recognizing that this ha- has been rec- has recognized as a very powerful class of of molecule and um and that being said they're very expensive to make um and they once that enzyme so basically the way we do that uh currently is we take a microbe uh like a bacteria or possibly like a a cell line or something or a yeast and then we engineer that microbe to make the enzyme and then we purify the enzyme out and we take that and then it's this like unstable uh, molecule that can't be ingested or else it would break down like immediately in your mouth or your stomach and then um, it won't get in your body. So you sort of have to like keep it uh, frozen or refrigerated. You have to inject it. And so, you know, it's like $2,000 a dose for these medications. And so I thought that like we could sort of cut out the middleman if we took a probiotic bacteria, so a bacteria that was already safe to eat, and then engineer that bacteria to make the enzyme directly inside your body. Um, and that enzyme would perform some useful function for people. And uh, so after my PhD, I was designing, I was working for a, a, a contra- contract research organization designing clinical trials for drug companies. And um, and I sort of saw how, uh, generally speaking, drugs are brought to market and, and the path that 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 requires. And, and seeing that all this really amazing technology was really being siloed for diseases and drugs. And, and you know, that's important and that's good, but there was an opportunity to adapt this, like the, this idea I had um, to kind of consumer space. Um, you know, it usually is the case that a new technology kind of goes into like the most extreme use cases. And then maybe 20 years later, it trickles down and everybody gets to use it. Um, but there's no reason for that to be the case. And so I saw that there was a really cool opportunity to kind of impact people in their healthy lives rather than only when they're sick with the use of biotechnology and engineer probiotics. So, um, that was what we did. We took a probiotic bacteria, safe, edible bacteria, bacteria you likely eat every day of your life. And then we engineered it to perform, to express an enzyme essentially that performs some useful function directly inside your body so that you can like eat that bacteria and then temporarily sort of gain this new function. Um, And that that was a really exciting idea. And obviously by not wanting to make a drug that, that narrowed down targets we could, we could apply that technology to, Um, you know, we, we didn't want to cure diseases. And so we had to think of like, what are things that healthy people deal with um, that are not life or death? Um, that we could that we could focus on, and so that's how we kind of zeroed in on. There was sort of a short list of ideas, but one being um, the morning after drinking and the way you feel after drinking, and, and and seeing that there's an opportunity to have to create something that could help with that. Amazing, yeah. I'm a big fan and believer of the power of microbes um, to transform our food system and all these various gut axes. And I'm sure we're going to get into all the fun science. Um, but I'd love to start with this idea of the hangover that you just mentioned, because obviously your product today 
is is essentially aimed at uh, you know avoiding hangovers um, preventatively. So, how does alcohol get metabolized in the body today? Um, how do we go from you know I guess ethanol to acetaldehyde to acetate, and like where does that kind of wreak havoc on our bodies that leads to us feeling like crap the next day? Yeah, exactly. And so first I'll, I'll say, and, and I'll get to it in more detail uh, as I describe kind of the biochemistry of alcohol metabolism and how that creates kind of the way you feel the next day. But what we have here is not, and we're very careful to, to say that like this product is not, does not like prevent a hangover because I think a hangover is very, it, it's sort of the convergence of a lot of things happening in your body at once. Um, and it's also very loaded term, a lot of different experiences with it. So what we do, our product is meant to break down that toxic intermediate you mentioned acetaldehyde. So I'll, I'll get to that and I'll explain how our product kind of fits into the overall story around, um, you know, uh, alcohol. So essentially when you drink, um, most of the alcohol you drink is, is absorbed pretty quickly into your bloodstream and the alcohol, the ethanol specifically sort of like circulates throughout your body and creates the effect that alcohol creates. And then it is largely processed by your liver and your liver basically uses one enzyme to convert the alcohol, the ethanol into acetaldehyde. Um, and then a second enzyme immediately converts that acetaldehyde into acetate. Um, and acetate is essentially vinegar. It's innocuous. It's an energy source. Um, Many, many more metabolic things happen to that acetate later, but at that point, from a toxicity standpoint, alcohol has been, your body has detoxified the alcohol. Um, but that intermediate acetaldehyde, so um, the second, that first step, that acetaldehyde is actually much more toxic than alcohol itself. It's a highly reactive molecule. Um, and the good news is your liver you know, knows that. And so it couples those reactions. So that intermediate acetaldehyde that forms in the liver is almost in entirely converted immediately to acetate. So it's like a very quick one, two punch, um, in the liver. Now, um, that's what happens to most of the alcohol, uh, you drink. Um, that being said, a small amount of the alcohol that you drink, bef uh, basically, you know, you goes in your mouth, goes on your esophagus in your stomach, and then goes into your gut. Um, and, uh, most of that's absorbed, but a small amount that makes it into your gut is actually processed directly in the gut, large in large part by the microbes that live in your gut. Um, and those microbes are good at expressing the enzyme that converts alcohol to acetaldehyde. Um, and they're concerned with getting rid of the alcohol, the ethanol, because that's sort of, you know, that's toxic to them. Um, but they're not as good as expressing that acetaldehyde, uh, the enzyme that breaks down the acetaldehyde. So what happens is that that um, a small amount of the alcohol that's in your gut is processed from alcohol to acetaldehyde, but not subsequently from acetaldehyde to acetate. Um, and so you actually get acetaldehyde accumulation in the gut. Um, and even though it's a very small part of the alcohol metabolism, it actually ends up being the major source of acetaldehyde because of the fact that the liver is so good at breaking down the acetaldehyde. So um, basically you get this accumulation in the gut and we see like colonic levels of acetaldehyde five to 10 times higher than blood acetaldehyde. But then essentially all night long, that acetaldehyde is slowly leaking out of your gut into your bloodstream. And just like the alcohol, that acetaldehyde then circulates through your bloodstream, sort of wreaks havoc throughout the body. And acetaldehyde is an extremely toxic molecule, um, much more toxic than alcohol itself. So, you know, it's causing um, DNA damage, cell death, all these crazy things um, that essentially fundamentally what matters for you is that they make you, f it makes you feel terrible, right? Like all that, all that, kind of havoc it's wreaking results in inflammation and like that sort of like just misery that you feel the next day. Um, and then eventually that acetaldehyde makes its way to the liver and then your, your, your liver is very good at breaking it down. Um, and so what we've done with Zbiotics is just uh, kind of move that function of the liver into the gut. Um, so that we can take care, we can help your body complete that reaction in the gut the same way it does in the liver so that that acetaldehyde doesn't build up uh, and doesn't kind of wreak havoc throughout the body. Um, so you notice that like we're really focused on specifically gut-derived acetaldehyde with this product. There's other things that are happening to you when you drink. So the ethanol itself, in addition to having sort of the intoxication effects it has, it also like causes, binds to receptors in your brain that mess with your sort of like excitation and like depression signals. So like, m which really messes with the quality of your sleep and messes with blood sugar regulation and a lot of, uh, the hormone balances in your body. And so there are other things you have to deal with beyond the acetaldehyde. That being said, the acetaldehyde is pretty gnarly. And so by us helping you deal with that, we think we're having a major, you know, we, the hypothesis was that we could have a, a major impact on the way you feel the next day. So, um, uh, that is essentially how Zbiotics fits in. 
and I'll make one other important point is that like there is a really common misconception. You notice one thing I didn't say is dehydration. Um, it's a really common misconception uh, that alcohol uh, causes dehydration and that that dehydration is like the major cause of a hangover, which is just simply not true. Like there's decades of data that in, in the scientific literature that show clearly uh, and, and irrefutably that dehydration has nothing to do with the way you feel the next day. In fact, alcohol doesn't even really dehydrate you. Um, it does inhibit the antidiuretic hormone and you do end up peeing one extra time when your blood alcohol initially rises. So the data shows that that happens, but then throughout the night, as you continue to notice that you urinate, that observation kind of was connected to the idea that, oh, that, that must be dehydrated. It's actually just due to the fact that you're ingesting a lot of fluid. Um, so if you're drinking the same volume of water as you were beer or wine, you, you would actually, you know, it's been shown that you would pee the exact same amount of time. So, so you're really not actually pee more, you're, and there's no biochemical markers of dehydration, there's no like electrolyte imbalance or glucose imbalance, anything like that um, coming. So, so, so there's really, like dehydration is not something that you're, you're dealing with in any major sense. Maybe one glass of water different, you know, but really nothing major here. Fascinating, I learn something new every day. Um, let's talk about, like, give us the Z-Biotics product pitch. And then talk maybe about how you modified this strain of Bacillus subtilis, which is found in natto, uh, which is a common, you know, Japanese soybean, uh, to make the enzyme that eats, uh, acid, as, as, as you pronounce it, acid, acid aldehyde, I think. Yes. Yeah, acid aldehyde, um, exactly. Acid aldehyde. Yeah, totally. So the, we basically, yeah, we start with this probiotic bacteria uh, called Bacillus subtilis or B. subtilis. Um, and this is a microbe that is ubiquitous. Like you likely already eat it every day of your life. It's in the soil. It's on the surface of fresh fruits and vegetables and probably most of the foods you're eating. It's everywhere. Um, and so it's not only probably the safest microbe, uh, with regards to human health on the planet. It's also probably the second best studied organism on the planet. Uh, maybe with the exception of E. coli being a slightly better study, but it's extremely well studied, well understood and very safe and, and, and you constantly eat it. So, um, all we did was we took that bacteria that you already eat every day. And as you pointed out, like it's also used in the fermentation of certain foods, like natto is a fermented soybean. Um, it's a part of the, uh, community of microbes that do the fermentation often for kombucha. So it's a really common microbe to even can consume in high quantities intentionally through fermented foods. So very, very common microbe. Um, then we took that bacteria and we engineered it um, to express an enzyme very similar to one your liver uses uh, to break down acetaldehyde. So that enzyme is called an acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. And so it essentially just converts that acetaldehyde into acetate or vinegar, um, or essentially vinegar, um, which is uh, innocuous. Um, and so uh, we did that by leveraging the natural ability that bacteria already do to edit their own genomes. Um, so bacteria are 3 billion years old. Um, and they are constantly sampling their environment. Part of their natural process is bacteria play a numbers game. They sample their environment, um, and there's bits of DNA floating around all the time from dead cells and stuff like that. And, and they'll basically like naturally take up DNA from their environment, and then they'll basically compare it to their own genome. And if it's reasonably similar, they'll actually swap in that random piece of DNA. And the idea there is that like maybe this will give me some kind of advantage. Um, and if it does, I'll keep it. If it doesn't, I'll die, but that's okay because I have you know, billions of brothers and sisters out there that will live on. And so every once in a while, you hit on something great. So that's why bacteria edit their own genomes and they can do it extremely efficiently and extremely precisely down to like a single base pair, or like a p single piece of code uh, in the DNA. Um, and so we can leverage the fact that bacteria already do this to design pieces of DNA that we literally just put into the growth medium with our bacteria, and then the bacteria will take up the DNA and edit its own genome. Um, so it's really just leveraging a very natural, it's actually, it's called natural competence and homologous recombination. They're something that bacteria already naturally do, and we just sort of guide that process so that it edits it the way we want it to. So we just design a piece of DNA that codes for the enzyme that breaks down acetaldehyde. The bacteria then take up that DNA, integrate it, and then they start making the enzyme themselves. Um, and then voila, we have, a probiotic bacteria that now expresses an enzyme that we we want it to express and it, it's really like that simple amazing and this is the world's first you know genetically modified 
uh, probiotic on the market, correct? Yeah, exactly. So we've been engineering microbes for like 40 years, um, but nobody has ever engineered a probiotic bacteria that you can eat. Um, so in, the engineering has been sort of siloed into research or like say drug applications or like it's been used for a while in manufacturing. Um, but the idea that we could engineer a microbe, a safe edible microbe that you could eat is something that nobody had done to date, or at least nobody had brought to market. There are drug companies working on this technology for drug applications. We're obviously able to move much, much quicker because um, we're not building a drug. So sort of the, you know, the path to market is, is much shorter than for, for drug applications. But um, so, so with that in mind and, and with that insight that we could take this as a consumer product, we were able to go to market uh, first and have, yes, yeah, so we have the world's first ever genetically engineered probiotic of any kind for any indication. Amazing. And you're able to sidestep that FDA pro process because it's, um, because it's just uh, generally recognized as safe bacteria and not necessarily some sort of pharmaceutical, correct? Yeah. So it's, it's all about the application. And I wouldn't say that we sidestepped it. It's that like, we basically, we decided we weren't going to build a drug. And so that meant that we, you know, if you're building a drug, that's sort of a life or death situation. Like you can imagine, right, for instance, a good example of this would be like, let's say uh, we were to engineer this probiotic bacteria to make human insulin uh, for people who are diabetic. Um, the, that could be a really cool application, right? But uh, there's a lot of challenges that go into that um, in the sense that you can't make too much insulin, uh, you know, or else that would be bad, right? Um, and you can't make too little or else that would be bad. So you have to make exactly the right amount in the, exactly the right times so when people need them. And so... Um, which means that the, you have to do a lot of sort of interesting kind of engineering of the bacteria to make sure that those things will happen. And then after you do that, you have to then prove to the FDA that that's, that thing you engineered is, won't break in the body, right? You'll eat it and it will reliably, un, like, unlike a machine, right? Bacteria kind of have minds of their own. So it's not like a medical device or something. It's something that, you know, the bacteria could could replicate and mutate it or change it in some way. And then you would get an inappropriate amount of, uh, of of insulin, which would be very dangerous. So, so for obvious reasons, the FDA has like really stringent guidelines to show that you're doing that correctly. So we decided to limit our scope of the things we could build. And then we build something that, so with our first product, it expresses this enzyme acid out of dehydrogenase that has no risk of being overexpressed. If we, so we basically program the bacteria to make a ton of the enzyme all the time. Um, the no, no necessary kind of like on off switch or anything. Um, because if there's no acetaldehyde around, the enzyme just doesn't do anything and it causes no issues. And then if there is acetaldehyde around, it'll break it down. And so by doing that and by not basically like nobody's going to die of like, you know, a diabetic coma, uh, if our product ends up not working. So, um, the, the, the stringency with which we had to demonstrate that the product worked was less because like, you know, people's lives aren't on the line here. It's just kind of their next morning. And, um, because of that, we basically have, you know, we had to do a lot of work to demonstrate that the product was safe. Um, but beyond that, we didn't have to do the same level of rigor to demonstrate that like the product was perfect, um, in terms of like, um, efficacy and, uh, and like not like breaking and all those sorts of things, because, um, you know, we're dealing with sort of like healthy people in their healthy lives. And so the FDA takes sort of like a different regulatory practice with, with, with that kind of stuff, which you see everywhere, right? Like all the product, and that's true for any food or supplement product you find in the grocery store that the regulatory process is the same. Um, and so, you know, we chose to go via that route for that reason. Yep. Makes a lot of sense. Um, I know anecdotally when I've taken Z, Z biotics before and then been like, yeah, actually there's a non-alcoholic beer I could try. I actually end up just going for the alcohol. Cause I'm like, what is, well, I don't, I didn't know that just having it sitting around is, is fine. I feel, I felt like it was going to be like looking for something to attack uh, and I needed to do something. Definitely but, not. Uh, you like, in fact, I would definitely encourage, we take the biotics and then there's a really great non-alcoholic, non-alcoholic option. I think that's a great, mm -hmm. I think you should definitely do that. It's a great choice. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, you definitely have to like feed the bacteria. You can, you know, yeah. you can take the bacteria okay. and not drink. Yeah. So I'd love to just go over the product offering. Can you show it to us? Tell us when you're taking it, how it's hanging out in the gut, waiting for the acid aldehyde to, to come at it so I can just smash it and kind of, you know, give us the time frame from the, from the point which, you, you know, when you're supposed to start taking it to what you can expect to feel the next day. And you're going to have, I guess you're going to still be hungover, but you're not going to really feel, I mean, I don't feel like I have a hangover when I do it. Um, my brother, you know, recently got married and he definitely put it to the test. Um, <laughs> I put it to the test, but not to his level. But, um, 
I can say that it works for me, but would love to hear from you. Like, give us, show us, you know, the product and how you're supposed to use it and how it's kind of all functioning. Totally. So yeah, the, it's very it's a small, like liquid shot. So it's sort of like, basically like, um, this is just water, a little bit of flavor and our genetically engineered probiotic. And that's all that's in here. And, and we decided we wanted to make it small so that it was like portable and you have to spend all, you know, it wasn't like an eight ounce can of, you know, carbonated liquid or something that would take forever to drink. It was, it was, you could just take a quick shot of this before you start drinking um and then you're covered for the whole night uh, because the bacteria are alive so once you drink them they go they so the bacteria we use b subtilis um is a as i say is a natural soil microbe and actually forms this really resistant endospore which is like um it's basically the bacteria are encapsulated and dormant um and when they're in that endospore they're extremely resilient to big fluctuations in temperature they can tolerate extremely high temperatures or low temperatures um, they can persist like that indefinitely, uh, and they can, for instance, pass your stomach acid unharmed when they're in that endospore state. Um, so they've actually pulled bis or bacillus endospores from like ice flows that are literally a hundred thousand years old, and the bacteria in there are still alive, um, and they can culture them. It's pretty amazing. So um, this bacteria is like comes prepackaged, is very very stable. Um, and so then you drink it; it's in that endospore, it passes through your mouth and your stomach acid unharmed, and then. It, uh, when it gets into your gut, when it gets out of your stomach and into your intestines, um, it senses that the environment is conducive um, to wake up. There's nutrients floating around in there. There's um, some, some chemical signals from your, from your gallbladder and things that, that trigger its natural ability to wake up. So all these things nature already provided for us, this like great encapsulation and this like ability to wake up or germinate once it gets into the gut. So um, it does that all on its own. Um, and then when it wakes up in the gut, um, it starts floating around and enjoying its environment as it kind of floats through the river that is kind of your, your intestines. And while it's all while it's doing all that, it's also doing what that one extra function of of uh, expressing that acetaldehyde dehydrogenase enzyme. Um, and so, if it encounters acetaldehyde, it will um, help break that acetaldehyde down or convert it into acetate. Um, if it doesn't, it will just pass right through you and and do nothing. And that's fine too. Um, and it will typically pass through your body um, in about, for most people, 18 to 24 hours. Obviously, that differs on the person and the night, depending on what you ate, what your microbiome is like, what your biology is like, all those things kind of factor into it. But in a general sense, I mean, you're definitely going to be covered for for several hours, for a full day or full night uh, of drinking. So um, you take this before you start drinking. I typically take it immediately before I start drinking, like right before my first drink. But you could theoretically take it a couple hours earlier like if you want to take it before you know you start getting ready and go out later that's also fine because it, it's going to persist for a long time awesome and then the next day oh uh, yeah what, what does that look like right so yeah so it's breaking down it's helping your body kind of like deal with this acetaldehyde um and and then so the next day you wait so you drink all night or whatever and have however many drinks you have you know one drink two drinks five drinks whatever that might be um and basically what you're dealing with, like to, to simplify, is really like the effects of acetaldehyde and the effects of alcohol. Um, and our product helps you deal with the effects of acetaldehyde. And so that's sort of like that, that misery, that malaise, like all that stuff, right? Um, but alcohol causes poor sleep. Alcohol itself, ethanol itself causes poor sleep. Um, it causes some endocrine imbalances, things like that. So then depending on how much you drink, like, you know, normally you would drink, you deal with like these really severe symptoms from the acetaldehyde um, and these less severe things from the alcohol, right? And then the more you drink, the more both of them go up. With z we're helping you deal with all the acetaldehyde stuff, but the more you drink, the more you're going to have to deal with those alcohol, regardless of how, if you took 10 z right, it wouldn't, wouldn't make any difference. Um, and so, so depending on how much you drink, you're going to have to deal with some of those effects. And so the next day you might wake up if you drink a lot and you feel probably groggy because you definitely didn't get good sleep, right? Like alcohol really affects the quality of your sleep and people underestimate, especially as we get older, how much our bodies need sleep. And so even if you were in bed for eight hours, if you're drunk that whole time or intoxicated that whole time, you're really only going to get like an hour or two of quality sleep um, or the equivalent of like an hour or two of quality sleep. So, so you're dealing with like, so you'd be dealing with that, like tired, groggy, maybe a mild headache from that or lack of concentrations and fogginess, things like that. But generally speaking, that's an easier thing to deal with, right? Like, um, and you're probably dealing with some blood sugar dysregulation, things like that. So um, a good breakfast and, a, and some coffee, um, and you're probably pretty much good to go in most cases, depending. I mean, obviously, if you drink a ton or if your body reacts differently to 
to the alcohol or like, you know, cause alcohol itself can cause inflammation as well. And so, so there are, we do see like a small subset of people, um, who don't really like notice the difference. And I think we're, we're creating a benefit, but it's sort of drowned out by kind of the other stuff that's happening. But generally speaking, 95% of people, and that, that number is, you know, we do a lot, we've done a lot of consumer testing that 95% of people see like a, a really nice benefit from the product and, and have mild to kind of no issues, uh, the next day. That's really a bummer to hear about all the other effects of alcohol because I just thought, oh, z just makes drinking healthy, but obviously we can't endorse that message right. because yeah. it's and, just and about be, mediation. Totally. And I want to be really clear <laughs> about that. That's actually a really important central point to our mission and who we are is that like this is not a get out of jail free card. Um, this is <laughs> another tool in the toolbox for responsible drinking behavior, for responsible drinking behaviors, mm -hmm. right? Like you still have to kind of drink in moderation, pace yourself, don't drink on an empty stomach. All those things are really important. Um, your body is still dealing with ethanol, which is the thing that is stressing your liver out the most. So all the like liver toxicity and all those things, we do nothing to help with that. Like alcohol is still toxic, still not good for you. And, and z doesn't change that at all. It's really only dealing with a small amount of acetaldehyde in your gut that can have an outsized impact on the way you feel the next day. But like the damage from alcohol is still real and z doesn't help with that. So this isn't like, you know, yeah, like the thing you can use to now just like kind of do whatever you want uh, guilt-free. Damn. And, yeah, Okay. right. And, and I will say that like the whole point <laughs> of the product though, like, right, like this, the, that gets to kind of the deeper issue here, right? Like that, like, or, or the deeper thing we're trying to get at, right? Is the idea that like people who want to make healthy choices, right? Like this is an, uh, this is another tool for you as somebody who wants to be responsible, right? And like, as you mentioned kind of at the beginning of this episode, that even people who are responsible and healthy, like you're going to occasionally drink. That's like a normal part of a social interaction and that's okay. Right. It's, it's an important part of, uh, of, of the way we socialize as humans. There are things we can do to help with that. Right. And like, that's like choosing to alternate alcoholic and non-alcoholic drinks or making sure we stop earlier in the night so that we can sober up before we go to sleep. So we get better sleep, like taking z -biotics. all those things can help you be more responsible, like land your feet better. And so I, interestingly, I, and I, I feel this way and I've had a lot of people tell me the same is that like by taking, by drinking Z-Biotics before you start drinking, it's sort of like almost like a mental cue to remind you to have like more responsible habits at the night. Like mm. you're already taking that first step, right? So it's saying that to yourself at the beginning of the night, I'm going to be responsible tonight and I am going to make my commitments tomorrow. I'm going to wake up and I'm going to work out or whatever that might be, you know? So I think that there's a lot that goes into that as well as the biochemistry of the product. Yeah, you're priming your mind for the day ahead, for the exactly. presentation you have to do at work, and you're trying to maximize your social life and get everything in there. And it's a modern, right. you know, it's a modern tool for the modern person. Exactly. Yeah, this is a way to to exercise increased control over your over your life right. and your decisions. Um, and I think that's really important. Love it. I w would love to go zoom in a little bit more, like. Who are your like core diehard yeah. consumers that are that you see reordering this, like the different segments of customers and like how are they finding out about you and where are they getting this maybe on your site and then outside of your site? Where are the different channels? Yeah, I think one of the surprising um, but like, you know, pleasantly surprising things to see was that was that indeed our our loyal customers and the people and the, the biggest subset of our customer base was people who fit kind of the the psychographic that we were just describing, these are like, we saw this huge overlap in fitness um, enthusiasts, like fitness enthusiasts and our product, right? People who had like something to lose the next morning. They have a morning routine with like a morning workout and stuff that like z was like really something that, that, that was very valuable to them. And they were kind of very loyal customers. And that came mm. out during COVID a lot as people were kind of like redefining their routines and focusing on their health. Um, z fit in that. So really it's like, the, like, I'd say that our key kind of core demographic is people in their 30s and 40s um, who are investing in their health and their wellness generally um, and, uh, and, and, and are people who you know, basically value experiences. They go out, they're social, they, they take trips, things like that. And, and so z is something that allows them to get the most out of all the things they're trying to accomplish. And that's great because that was who we wanted to build the product for, not like, you know, Vegas bros or, you know, <laughs> uh, like college kids or anything like that. Like that was definitely not the focus and, and, the, and, right. and that's not really where the benefit lies. So I think that that's, that's kind of where we've seen the most people. And then 
to your question about where people find us and how people find out about us, um, it's been through, I mean, still, you know, a good third to, a, uh, you know, it used to be about half, but now um, as we've grown more, it's like a good third of our customers come just through organic word of mouth. Um, people trying the product, telling their friends, like, um, which is great. Um, you know, people love the product and it's a fun product to talk about. It's a good conversation starter. So um, people often will have the product out with them at a bar or at a party and, and they'll share it with their friends and talk about it. So that that's great. That's the best way for us to get a customer um, and the best way for people to find out about us. Um, but also we do like a lot of advertising um, on like po podcasts and, um, you know, YouTube channels and things like that where where people, it's kind of the same idea, right? Like somebody's like gets to talk about the product, tell them about it, right? Like this, normally when you think about like sort of like a hangover product, it's usually some snake oil vitamin mix <laughs> that like you see in the gas station and there's a lot of eye rolls and, and I totally get that. There's a lot of skepticism and there should be. Um, so with that in mind, like we have a little bit of a hill to climb and explaining why our product is different. And, and so any opportunity where we get to do that, I think it is, is valuable. And so that's where like things like podcasts are great is, you know, and also like, you know, we can, you know, people are there because they have a certain interest. Um, and so we see that with like, definitely with fit, fitness podcasts were one of the first ways we figured out that fitness was a key demographic. And then, um, but then also people are finding out about us like on news and all, all different kinds of things where people are just investing in themselves and, and their betterment. Um, I think like really where, where we find most of our customers. Awesome. And, and you're just selling online or are there also any other channels? Basically online, like we basically like 99% of our sales go through our website. Um, we have, we do have a placement in a few gyms and, and wellness shops, uh, throughout the country where just small retailers, like yeah. people who really like the product and were associated with, or, or, uh, a gym or something said like, we'd love to carry your product. Um, you know, our per and their personal trainers will recommend it to their clients and stuff like that. And so a few things like that where we'd like to expand that a little bit more and find, I think, you know, if we just put it on the shelf in a grocery store, you walk right by it and you just assume it was garbage if you'd never heard about it. And so um, we're looking for places where we can tell that story a little bit. Like, I think, you know, and, and target people where it makes sense, like, like, in a hotel or in a nice restaurant or, or some, or a kind of specialty shop, like, or even, you know, more, more of the gym, more gyms and things like that. So, um, that's what we're looking at for the future. It's the shot before the shot. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. Your first drink of the night. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's inherently viral. Like when I go to like a wedding or I go to a party, you know, I typically feel guilty being, you know, knowing I have this superpower in my back pocket and I bring a couple and I just like, okay, here, I like you, you can have one of these. They're like, what's this? And then I show them this little video, right, of the animation of like, you know, oh, yeah. it's like that game of like knocking out the acid, acid Um And they're just like, huh. My friend was getting married and like he, you know, he was about to go up and get married and I was like, you're going to thank me tomorrow morning. And <laughs> the next morning I'm on the balcony of my hotel and he's just like, dude, where did you come? Where, where what is the Z biotics thing? Like come down here and, and like, you know, <laughs> sit on my lap because you're God. You know? and I was just like, yeah. Totally. Yeah. No, I love that. And yeah, totally. Like I agree with you, like the virality of it. I mean, it's once you've, you know, tried it and you like it, it's like, it's so like exciting to kind of share that around and be the person who's like, Hey, like I got this thing that actually works because you know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of junk out there. And, and I think that that's like a lot of fun. And we've, we've tried to figure out ways to like encourage that more. It's, uh, at the end of the day though, I think people like doing it like on their own, they don't want it to be transactional. And so they kind of, so, you know, um, that's been great. I mean, it's a lot of fun. How, how would you com you know, compare yourselves obviously like there's there's so many of these other products so, like how do you compare yourself to the li liquid ivs even some of the actual ivs like my friend the, yeah. after new year's was like oh i'm going to like get a shot of right. this like you know to hydrate myself and i'm just like no i'm not get, doing any needles or any yeah. of this like um uh, i actually ran out of z biotics on new year's but i was just like you oh, know what whatever sorry. i'll but I was like, I couldn't get it in time. You know, yeah. it's like, I wish it was at the 7-Eleven or whatever at the gas station. At some point, but... I want to get there. Right? <laughs> when it's about access, that's exactly that. Like, I, I hate that people yeah, have to go wait. Puff. Yeah, Right, yeah. Go, that would be really, that would be killer. Like, yeah. I would order a 24-pack on GoPuff and just keep it, right? Totally. Um, but I guess, yeah, break, break down, like, the landscape of, of all these different solutions that are out there today, why they may or may not work, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, so there's, yeah, I mean, we'll start with, like, First, sort of like the products that are not 
uh, IVs, like, uh, you know, like just stuff you can get uh, at the store, and powders or drink mixes or drinks. Um, and they're, they're all, basically everything that's out there right now is just different mixes of the same, like 10 to 15 different kind of random vitamin, semi-random vitamins and plant extracts. And so you see things like, you know, B vitamins and you'll see like milk thistle and N-acetylcysteine and um, uh, DHM. And like, so these are, these are just sort of like plant extracts that prickly pear, all these kind of strange things. Um, and they have, and they're all basically around the idea of uh, focus around the idea of like, first and foremost, dehydration, right? Like the idea that electrolytes and vitamins are going to fix your problem. And they obviously don't, right? Because like humans have been drinking for 6,000, intentionally been like fermenting alcohol for 6,000 years, right? And like, if there was like a plant or a vitamin that like that helped you, then we wouldn't be just discovering that now, right? Like that this would be known for at least decades, right? And so like the, this is, all, and, and as we talked about earlier, you're not dealing with dehydration or any electrolyte imbalances or anything. Like that is very well demonstrated in the scientific literature. And the only reason why that myth continues to pervade the public is that it's perpetuated by the, like, the observation that you pee more, um, which is not real. Um, and then like this belief that we'd like to have some sort of control. So all these companies kind of like market these, these vitamin mixes. And so, uh, and then the random plant extracts are just like anything else, right? Like sort of, you know, can you tell your sort of like ancient herbal kind of story around these things? And, um, and, and they don't work. Um, and, and they're, and they're not, and they're shown to not work. And so they don't really benefit in any way, but like that doesn't stop brands from kind of like mixing them into a bottle and then putting a new brand on it and telling a new story about it. And then they pop up and they, they acquire customers early, but then they can't maintain them because the products don't actually help anybody. And so then they kind of fade off and then a new one pops up in its place. And so that's kind of like the, the merry-go-round that has happens with, uh, with kind of the products that are out there right now. And so we're really trying to separate ourselves all together from the category. And like, and that's one of the reasons why we don't talk about ourselves as like a hangover cure, because I think, you know, part of the problem is that people are kind of promising these like silver bullets um, in hopes that somebody will buy their product and they don't really care if they retain the customer um, because the product doesn't work. And so, we we'll really try to be very scientific and explain exactly what we're doing, why it's different, why there's nothing else like it, and like what you can expect the product to do and not do. Um, and, and that's just real science um, and honesty to the consumer, which we believe is a much more strong strategy to kind of like retain customers and develop a trusting relationship with them. Um, so that's kind of how we differ. And so that obviously puts a big burden on us. We have to tell a coherent story quickly because people don't have all day to listen to me, like, you know, tell every single one of them, every like detail of the science and everything. So, um, so that's a, that's a marketing challenge in its own right, but that is kind of our approach and, and how we differentiate. Love it. Um, would love to just maybe briefly touch on kind of the GMO side of this and definitely, you know, what are, what are the inherent like connotations that come with GMO? Obviously in food, we think a certain thing, but here, GMO is is used as kind of the, the system to like, you know, essentially express or like essentially a plug and play platform that can express specific enzymes in high quantities, which gives us this as acid acetyl I can't pronounce it acetaldehyde eater yeah. product, right? right. Yeah. So, uh, so it's a net positive, but there's obviously there's some baggage there. So can we very touch a little bit on that? Yeah, or, absolutely. Or, I mean, this is. Honestly, the thing that is probably most near and dear to my heart about the company is the a bit, like the hopefully the ability to elevate this conversation around GMOs. Like so, um, unfortunately, there is a lot of fear and mistrust around the technology, which was conflated with bad business practices that were enabled by that technology. So, like um, people not liking the way that certain companies use genetic engineering and GMOs. Um, for instance, in the agriculture industry, um, and right. not liking the things, the, the business practices that enabled. And then um, the nuance of saying that, like, the technology that created it um, is now bad, and that anything that's created with that technology is unsafe and bad. Um, and unfortunately, those two things are very different, right? Like, um, genetic engineering, or, 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 you know, so a GMO is a genetically modified organism, um, which means that it was an organism that was modified with genetic engineering. So, genetic engineering is a tool that creates products, right? And those products could be good or bad, um, or they could be used for good or bad, right? But the, the tool itself um, is not 
inherently good or bad. It is just a tool. So the analogy I often use is like, you may be potentially like one may be anti guns. Um, they may not, they say that guns are bad. Um, but that person probably doesn't think that metallurgy is bad, right? Like the technology used to make the gun, right? Because they recognize that metallurgy could also make a spoon, which is a very useful product um, and not dangerous and safe. And so the idea that like you are anti-gun does not mean you have to be anti-metallurgy and like that everything that's ever made with metal is bad. Um, and so I think that that's what's happened here, right? The idea that like I don't like these products that are GMO and therefore anything that is GMO is unsafe, dangerous, poisonous, whatever. Um, and so the idea that is that this is a very dangerous mentality that unfortunately a lot of brands are fanning the flames of fear on in order to sell their products at a higher price. So you walk through the grocery store and you'll see the non-GMO butterfly on so many products that have <laughs> nothing to do with genetic engineering whatsoever. There are only about ballpark about 10 <laughs> crops that are genetically modified, uh, 10 types of, of plants basically that are genetically modified, roughly speaking, in the food system. So like if you walk through the store and you see a, a bag of wheat flour that says non-GMO, that's useless because all wheat is non-GMO. There is no genetically engineered wheat. Um, and so all these companies, and these companies know that, but they're putting that on there to make you afraid that their customer, their competitor who doesn't have that butterfly in their bag is right. bad. Right. And so it's very short sighted because at the end of the day, genetic engineering is something is a tool that we can use to benefit humanity. And in fact, there's like huge yeah. existential fright crises that we are facing um, with like climate change and emerging uh, diseases and pandemics um, and feeding a growing population. Right. Like the idea that like we can go back to 17th century agrarian technology, right, like around like organic farming. Uh, and have that feed a population of people eight times larger than that time period is insane, right? We have an 8 billion population. We can't use inefficient farming practices. So that doesn't mean that all genetic engineering applications are good, but it means that like this is a really important technology that we need to use to fight climate change, fight like um, you know new emerging diseases and, 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 and feed a growing population of people. So the idea that these brands are throwing this technology under the bus to make a buck now is really painting us into a corner. And I'm very passionate about the idea that we should need to elevate this conversation, have a more nuanced view of like, there are genetically engineered products that are not dangerous and that are good and that are beneficial to me. So the hypothesis we started with was that if I, if we make a product that people want, that gives them real value, them, they themselves, um, real value that they would be willing to kind of hear us out that the fact that it's a GMO isn't necessarily a bad thing, right? Like if you walk into the store and you see non-GMO corn next to a can of GMO corn, you're going to definitely take the non-GMO corn because what good is it to you to take the GMO corn, you know, like, but if you walk into the store and you see a non-GMO probiotic that doesn't some random vague gut benefit, or you, you have our product that is genetically engineered to help you feel better the day after drinking, then there's some benefit to you. And so then now you can say, okay, well, do I want that benefit? And am I willing to learn more about whether or not the fact that it's GMO is safe or unsafe? And then, you know, that opens up the conversation. So that's what we're hoping to do. And so far, that's exactly what we've seen. That I think that it's way blown out of proportion how afraid, like, people are of genetic engineering. Like, there's a belief that everybody is anti-GMO. But when you actually look into the numbers and, and the surveys, the vast majority of people actually don't care one way or the other. There's a small but very vocal minority of people, about 10 to 15% of people who are very vehemently anti-GMO. And then there's a population of people, about 20 to 30% of people who are kind of anti-GMO. They are in surveys, but you know it's a conviction loosely held and they're willing to kind of hear people out. And then there's like 60% of people, the majority of people either have no opinion one way or the other or are pro-GMO. So the majority of people in the US do <laughs> not care um, or are pro-GMO. Um, and then there's a minority of people who do. And so there's still an opportunity here to impact the conversation and that is, that's the truth and that's the narrative that we are trying to get out there, right? That you, you're not alone if you don't care, right? It's not like everybody's anti-GMO. So um, that's kind of a, one of our missions as a, as a company is to advocate for the, for the responsible and transparent use of the technology for good. Yeah, awesome. I, I, I think there's just been so much exploitive behavior between brands and labels, whether it's like putting slapping vegan on things that mm -hmm. would never have any meat in them, like a chocolate totally. or something. I'm so happy this <laughs> this coconut milk is vegan, you know, like it's like, it's... obviously. <laughs> right. There's got to be a term for that. Someone's got to come up with like the something effect of right, that, right. whatever that is. But it's just like reassuring you of the thing that was inherently already there the whole time. Um, I guess 
you know, thinking about your product as a platform, like what are some of the other potential use cases for a G GMO probiotic? And maybe talk about some of the other axes that, mm -hmm. you know, our gut touches, whether it's, you know, longevity, depression, our skin, uh, all these gut axes between our brain right. and our and our gut. Like, w what are the potential applications here? Yeah, totally. I'll try not to nerd out too hard as a microbiologist on this. Uh, but yes, like, the gut and the gut microbiome, and and not and you know you have a microbiome on your skin and and uh, in your mouth and the vagina. All these things are very important sites of microbial kind of activity. And so I'll start by saying that um, you know some high pollutant stuff there around GMOs, and then you might step back and be like, yeah, but you made like a product for drinking, you know? Like it's like I get it, right? But um, the idea is that it, it was a proof of concept. It's a first step. It's a way to like you know uh, start with something that people understand um, that there's a very clear and visceral readout of efficacy for the for the consumer. They can try the product for themselves and feel the benefit. But ultimately, we, we, set, we never set out to build a product. You know, our company are focused on people's, like, you know, the way people feel after drinking. It was around kind of building incredible products using genetically engineered probiotics. Um, and so there's so many more things we can do. And this is really just Kind of step one on in an in introduction and so um the platform we built was a bacteria a safe edible bacteria that is able to constitutively and robustly express an enzyme um, whatever that enzyme might be and so constitutive and robust meaning like it can make a lot of the enzyme and it'll make that enzyme all the time no matter in you know the, the conditions of your gut or my gut or whatever um and so um the the first enzyme is an enzyme that breaks down acetaldehyde but like we can plug in other enzymes into that system, uh, or genes and coding enzymes into that system, um, and those and those enzymes can perform all, all kinds of other functions. And so, as you pointed out, there's so many biological functions that would be useful in your gut because your gut is like the core of so many ways that you function, which makes sense, right? Like it's it's the food hole, right? It's like it's what keeps you alive, um, and so it makes sense that your brain and your skin and everything is wired to respond to what you're putting in your body, which is keeping it alive. Um, and so, you know, there's lots of, you know, and I want to be careful not to overpromise here. Like basically we've recently realized and recently meaning within like the last 20 years, we've really come to appreciate how central and critical the microbiome is to our human health. That being said, the details are things we're still working out because it's very complicated, right? So interestingly, you have about as many bacteria in your body as you do human cells. Um, and so basically we discovered like a doubling. Uh, in it. Like when you think of ourselves as like a human, uh, really it's like you're more like an e a walking ecosystem than you are just like a, a single being. Um, and what's interesting is that all of your cells express that are like are encode the same genes, right? So we have equal number of cells, but like our cells all have the same code and all of the cells in your, in your gut have different, they're different bacteria with different codes. So it's actually a hundred or a thousand fold higher levels uh, or more biological functions being performed by your gut microbes than by your own cells. So a lot of the things that you think of as you and things you do, like the digestion of your food, the expression of molecules that make you feel happy or sad, the things that like regulate your circadian rhythm and your the way your body responds to um, attacks, like both from um, uh, you know infection, but also like um, chemical attacks. All those things are are all in large part functions of the microbiome, at least in concert with your body. And so, those are a lot of kind of levers that we can pull by engineering a microbe to perform an additional useful function. And so there's like, you know, a lot of content has been written lately around sort of the appreciation of the gut brain axis. There's basically like a super highway cable of chemical kind of conversation happening between your brain and the microbes in your gut. Um, the decisions you make about the foods you crave are likely not coming from you. They're actually probably signals, or at least in part, uh, signals from your gut microbes basically saying like, feed me a cheeseburger. Um, when you're like, <laughs> you rationally consciously know you should eat a salad, but you don't. Um, it's like, you mm -hmm. know, you might not even make that decision. And so um, all that is to say is like, kind of like that there's a lot of really cool things we can play with. So when we're thinking about it, Zbiotics is products related to, again, like healthy people healthier. Like how do you make better decisions? How do you live healthier in a world that challenges your health frequently, right? So like with more processed foods and more refined sugars and heavy metals in our drinking water and, and the inflammation we create, even when we exercise, um, you know, or breathe the air, like all those things are things that like pass through membranes 
that microbes have access to and that already are helping us deal with those things. So we can augment, improve, or add on to those functions by engineering a microbe to, to, to do them better. So help you extract nutrients better from your food, protect you from those toxins, much like we're protecting, you know, help protect you from acetaldehyde. Um, there are so many other things we can kind of do. So that's how we're thinking about the future of zebiotics. And I think the future of the category as a whole, right? Like we're the world's first ever genetically engineered probiotic. I promise you, we are not the last. Um, there will be many others like this. And so we're trying to build a responsible and exciting, lay the foundation for an responsible and exciting category that includes us, uh, but that there are many other companies will be doing as well. So um, really excited about kind of the future of, of this tech and this category. Me as well. That's, it's insane to hear about all these axes and, and the potential role that you can play. Um, and it's also insane to think about how McDonald's and other fast food companies have basically like somehow programmed our guts, um, unbeknownst to us. And now we've been like trained on this food, but, um, just wild to think about like if someone were to engineer something like, let's just say a burger that makes you happier, I don't know, yeah. like a real happy meal. Yeah. In the, um, yeah. Would that be food or is that going to fall under the medicine category? Because it's like an SSRI replacement if we start talking about the gut link to mood and depression. Well, I mean, you could argue that that's already been done, right? Like that, like that, like burgers do that reason why we they're addicting. The reason why we eat <laughs> them, right, is that they make you feel good. Um, and so, you know, it's a fine line, right? But like, yeah, if you were to say make a food that like specifically like released some you know something that like meant, serotonin yeah right that was like meant to like really like 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 biochemically affect your mood in a very specific and, re and reproducible way i mean it's all about like what you're doing and and how how you're claiming that right like so like the fda cares if you're trying to treat depression right like okay you're trying to treat a disease state and you are having a biochemical activity that is not typical um so you know again like where do you draw the line between a burger that already induces the release of serotonin from your microbiome and one that like is somehow programmed to do that more f efficiently or effectively. So, you know, gray areas all the way around. And this is where, this is how, and it, kind of getting into, um, not going too far down a rabbit hole, but something that we want to, we are already focusing on, um, for Zbiotics, which is advocating for clearer regulations, right? Like regulation is going to have to move forward with the advent of genetic engineer, like, you know, with better genetic engineering and better capabilities with food. Um, and so right now it's sort of like, like drug or not drug. Um, and then like when you're a supplement, it's like a whole different regs, but like nothing is accounting for the genetic engineering specifically. And we think that that's a problem that like the FDA should have very clear guidelines about what you can and can't engineer. And like, you know, cause we put on very strict guardrails for ourselves at Zbiotics and we try to be good actors, but not everybody might. And even unintentionally, they might not have just thought of certain kind of risky things that you could do with genetic engineering. And so, um, and, and, and do something that unintentionally creates a problem. So, we are focusing on trying to build real honest guidelines and guardrails to protect the industry and allow us to grow without having any sort of, you know, issues created by a well-meaning or well-intentioned bad actor. Fascinating. Yeah, it seems like it's going to be an increasing gray area as we move forward and yeah. uh, policy will always have to catch up as right. it always does. And so we'd like to be proactive if we can. And so that's what we're working right. on. So we'll see. Yeah. Fascinating to think about. Um, Kind of as we as we come towards the end here, you know, I think I, I think we both w w I think is something that we're both passionate about is to talk about. By the time this p podcast comes out, it will no longer be dry January; it will be February, and everyone will go back to drinking um, if they hadn't already broken their promise already. So, I'd love to, for us to just spend a little bit of time dissecting what is going on with this narrative that Gen Z is drinking more than millennials, mm -hmm. and that millennials are drinking. Sorry. Gen Z is drinking less than millennials. Yeah. Millennials are drinking less than Gen X and boomers. Um, and that everyone seems to be calling this essentially the new smoking. Um, you know, one of my favorite, you know, PhDs that I really respect and a podcaster and just an all around amazing guy, Andrew Huberman, says he doesn't believe that anyone should drink more than two drinks a week, which is, which I'm trying to live by, but finding it very hard. And you have this whole sober, curious movement. In California, where I live, we have kids that are doing Cali sober stuff where they just drink seltzer and do shrooms when they go to parties. And, or, or, or far worse, I mean, there's nothing wrong with shrooms, but there's far worse things that they're doing, like vaping instead of drinking right. and substituting this behavior. And all of it just feels like 
very uh, extreme. Yeah, exactly. I, I think that's a perfect word, and, and that's I think the idea, right? That like, look, humans are social creatures, and like part of what we do is like 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 currently drinking is built into the social fabric, and the idea that we get together and you know we require sort of like engagement and entertainment and so like that may take the form of a hike or, or whatever but it also may take the form of sitting around and talking which um you know with something that maybe changes or alters our mental state in some way and that's normal it's like it's 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 ingrained in who we are um and so to your point it's like if we're not drinking then we're looking for other ways to <laughs> intoxicate ourselves right which is like you know, maybe better or maybe worse. And so ultimately the goal here, I think should be about like developing a responsible relationship with alcohol. And, and like, I think that this trend, this note is, is people are recognizing that alcohol is not good for you. And um, in addition, it doesn't make you feel very good the next day. You kind of have to pay the piper. Um, and so there are like, are there other things we could do that are better? And I think that's a good question, right? We should constantly be trying to improve our behaviors um, and, and like being more healthy. And I think that like we know alcohol is not healthy and it's not safe. Um, so limiting the amount of alcohol you drink is a really good thing. Um, that being said, I think that like the idea that we can just like cold turkey eliminate it is also flawed, right? Because like best intentions aside, like that's just not the reality of how we work. And I think that like we, and that's not cynical. I think we have like evidence to show that like in all of our own lives and in, and like in humanity at large, right? That like people will always look for opportunities to like do things that they enjoy and like people enjoy drinking. And so what we should be doing instead of kind of like all or nothing strategies and, and I actually have issue with dry January because I think it's the same thing. It's like the idea of like, well, I had a great holiday season and now I'll <laughs> atone for that by just not drinking for a month and then I'll go back to my same behaviors as before. And that's like a really mm -hmm. like binge and purge mentality, which is not sustainable and it's not changing anything about your health at all because you're just going to go back to the same behaviors you had before. So like what I would advocate for instead of a dry January is, so maybe next year if this is coming out in February, is like instead of going dry in January, like develop responsible drinking habits that you can maintain all year long, right? Rather than like, like showing up at the Christmas party in December and going crazy, if for the last 11 months, you've been setting and sticking to rules and, and tweaking on rules that work for you around like, I'll never have more than, you know, two drinks in a night. Um, or like, I'll, I'll always start starting in my night with, um, you know, a non-alcoholic beverage, or I'll have a non-alcoholic beverage between every alcoholic beverage, or, you know, whatever it might be, you can set rules that like ensure you're drinking in moderation and pacing yourself and getting a good night's sleep. Like all those things, are responsible behaviors and associations with with like your adult right like uh, uh, adult behaviors around alcohol like developing a real honest and, and and healthy relationship with alcohol as opposed to like being like well I drank a lot so now I'm gonna not drink and then I'll feel better about myself um, which is really not helpful and so I think that like that is really the way we should be moving I think that like there's like these pendulum swings happening but like with the advent of a lot more non-alcoholic beers that are like high quality and, and non-alcoholic beverages that are like alcohol adjacent, like hop waters and things like that. Like, I think that like people are able, they have more tools at their disposal to do these things. And I think that's a really good and positive move. Um, if, you know, Huberman says two drinks in a week, that's what works for him. And that's probably based on data. Um, but like you have to decide ultimately what works for you. And so if two work, two drinks is, is not feasible and the result of trying and failing means whatever, I'll go back to what I was doing before, then that's no good. Then set your rule at like no more than six drinks in a week or whatever that might be. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the goal here is to find something that's sustainable and, and healthy, um, but allows you to kind of enjoy your life. And I think that, that that's really like that moderation and that adult behavior, I think is what, what we tried to, what we try to encourage, you know? Thanks for tuning in. If you like what you hear, please hit subscribe wherever you're listening to this podcast. And if you're curious to get a firsthand look at the cutting edge of food and tech, check out Hungry.tv. That's Hungry with No You, where you can join in on live conversations like these or sign up for the free weekly newsletter.